Welcome back to the Jungets Games playthrough for Frosthaven. At this point, we have gone through the first round of the game in a tutorial video where I also taught most of the rules. So if you missed that, then you can find a link for it down below in the description, or you can click the I up there in the top corner. Now, as always, I'd like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. There is a lot going on in this game, and there is a pretty real chance that I've made some more mistakes that I haven't caught just yet. So if you turn those Klingon subtitles on, then I can put the corrections on the screen, and that should make this as accurate a playthrough as possible. All right, let's jump back into the game. At this point, we are just starting off the second round of the game, and that means each player needs to decide if they want to play two cards or do a long rest. Now, I don't think anyone is going to be long resting, so we can all simultaneously select two of the cards from our hands. Now, before anyone makes any card decisions, the Blink Blade has to decide if they are going to be fast or slow. Now, if they want to be fast, they have to use a token, and they don't currently have any. So they are forced to go slow, which is going to add a token over there, and that means they'll be slow for this entire round. So let's look out here, and we currently have eight different cards to choose from in our hand. Now, when we see the current situation, we are the closest ones to this Algox Archer, and you'll notice it is wounded. Now, it needs five more damage to die, and when it activates again, it will take another damage from this wound. Now that means it would only need 4 damage to die, so if we were able to do 4 damage on this turn, that would be pretty great. Now if we look at our hand, we can see that we do have a couple of these range attacks. This is an attack of 3, and that one's an attack of 2. Now the range is 4 on that one, and 3 over here for the javelin, and you'll notice that that Algox Archer is only 2 spaces away. Now when it comes to moving, remember we are immobilized, and that is going to be the case until the end of this turn. So that means I think we should do a ranged attack for our top action, because obviously we have no melee attack options, and then we could do something good with the bottom action that does not involve moving. Now I think let's start by saying we'll use the javelin. We have a chance to do 4 damage if we draw a good card off of the top of our modifier deck, and now let's look to the bottom actions in the cards that we have left. Now, a couple of these have summons. You'll notice this one is a Banner of Hope. Now, that has four health, and it has no attack or movement, so it is a summon that will never move once it's summoned onto the board. Now, it says that all allies in range of two of this Banner of Hope will perform a heal one on yourself action at the start of each of your turns. Now, once this is removed from the board, we actually lose this card permanently, so that is a good thing to keep in mind. Now, we could place this right over here, that would help potentially heal our opponents if they're able to get a little bit closer, but it's possible that we might want to hold onto this until later on in the round. Now, looking at another option in our hand, we have this card called At All Costs. Now, it says we can summon a reinforcement, and this is a summon that does not do any damage. It has one health, and it has two movement. Now, the big uh, bonus for this is that you can control the movement of this summon. Remember, normally, the summons use the same movement and attack rules as the monsters on the board. What this means is we could summon that reinforcement and intentionally move them into a spot where they could soak up a big attack from one of these monsters, which is of course kind of like healing damage off of us because we would not be taking that damage. Well, I think that is pretty good, so let's go ahead and start with this. Now that means we have initiative options of 10 or 21. Now at this point, of course, while we're making these decisions, we are also discussing the options with our companions. Now the Deathwalker player has said that they are probably going to be uh, moving a little bit, but setting some stuff up, and they are hoping that their Shadow Beast is able to kill off this Algox Guard. Now it only needs one damage to die, so as long as uh, they get a decent attack in, that should be fine. Now the Blink Blade is going slow, and they have said that even though they are going slow, they are planning on heading over here to try and do a pretty big attack towards this Shaman. Now both of the initiatives for our companions are going to be relatively slow, they tell us, and we don't mind going very fast. So we will select the initiative of 10. Now that we've all made our decisions, we can flip these over, so we can show that our initiative is indeed 10. The Deathwalker's initiative is going to be very slow at 82, and the Blink Blade's initiative is going to be 47, because of course they are slow for this round. So we can put this right over here, and now we can see the Algok Shaman has an initiative of 23, and it's not actually going to be attacking, it's just going to be moving and healing. Now this Algox Archer right here has an initiative of 14. Uh, they are going to move a little bit potentially and have a weak attack, but then they are going to create a 3 damage trap onto an adjacent empty hex. Now after that we can look over here and the Algox Guard will activate on initiative 30 and they have a pretty fast move and a slightly less damaging attack. 
it's now time to start performing actions, and at initiative 10, we are the fastest figure in the game. So let's go ahead and take our turn. First things first, I think let's use the top part of the Javelin card to do a 3 damage attack towards this Algox Archer. It is within the 3 range, so we can now draw a combat modifier card, and it looks like we have hit a negative 1. Dang. If we had hit a positive 1 or positive 2, then that Algox Archer would actually be killed off this round, but it looks like we did not get so lucky. So this is going to be a 2 damage attack, which means that Archer has 3 life left. Next up, let's use our At All Costs Summon Reinforcement ability. Now with this, let's go with yellow because it kind of matches the color of our cards and we can put this reinforcement onto an empty adjacent spot to our character. Now I think we should go right over here and then it looks like we will get one experience. So we can put this right over here into the active area and I think at this point, let's go ahead and use our minor healing potion. This is a once per scenario activation and that is going to heal us up three damage. So we can flip that over and that will heal us right back up to our maximum of 10. Well, we are now done with our turn, and it looks like we did infuse Wind Elemental Energy as part of these actions, which means we can move that to the Strong Column. The very last thing we do on our turn is remove this immobilized status condition from our board. With our turn done, we can look back to all of these initiatives, and it appears that all three of the monsters are going to activate before either of the other characters. Now, the archers are going to activate at 14, so they get to go, and they have a move of minus 1, and then an attack of minus 1. And currently, there's just a single normal Algox archer, so we can see their range is 4 normally, and their attack is normally 3, but in this case, it will be 2. So, that Algox archer is here, and they are going to focus on us, because we are the closest enemy to them. Now we are within range, so they don't have to move, so they are now going to do that 3, minus 1, or 2 damage attack. They can flip over this card, and nice! Okay, that's another minus 1, so that means they will only hit us for 1 damage. Now we could of course lose a card from our hand, or 2 from our discard pile to mitigate this, but with just 1 damage coming in, I think we should definitely just take it. After that attack, we can see that the Algox Archer is going to create a 3 damage trap in an adjacent empty hex closest to an enemy. In this case, they only have one empty adjacent hex option, so they're going to put that right over there. And when any figure walks on top of this, they will take three damage, whether that is one of our characters, one of our summons, or one of the monsters. But it's worth noting that the monsters will only walk onto a trap if that's the only way for them to move in order to get their focused target into attack range. At this point, the archers are done, although I once again forgot that they are wounded, so they should have taken one damage before they activated. Sorry about that, and this means they only need two more damage to be defeated. Now we can move on from the archers, and it looks like the shaman are going to activate. Now they are going to move and then heal. Now at the moment, we can see that they are going to be focusing on our reinforcement summon, because it is two spaces away compared to the two spaces of the city guard. Now the city guard has an initiative of 51, and our summon has an initiative of just a little bit under 10, because that's what we did in this game. So that means it's going to break this tie. So the shaman is going to move right over here, and then it is going to target themselves or one of the other monsters to heal. Now unfortunately, we can see the shaman is three spaces away from the injured Algox guard. So they will then heal the Algox guard for three, which means it is back to having three total damage on it. Well, that's finished up the Shaman activations, and now the Algox guards get to go at initiative 30. Now there are two of them, and they have a move plus one, which means they have a move of four, and their attack is minus one, so it's currently at two. Let's activate them in ascending order, so Algox guard number one is going to attack the Blink Blade. Now the Blink Blade does currently still have a crude hide armor charge. So they can use that charge by pulling this token off and sliding this over, and now that attack has disadvantage. So the guard will draw the top two cards and use the worst one. It's good they had disadvantage because plus two is bad and minus two is awesome. All right, well, the disadvantage means that that guard is doing two minus two or zero damage with this attack. Next up, Algox guard number two is going to focus on this city guard. So it does not need to move and it is going to do a two damage attack and it will do two damage. All right, so we can look over here and the city guard does have one shield. So that's going to absorb one damage which means they will take one damage, and that is four damage total. So one more, and unfortunately, this city guard will die. 
Now, I did say that we lose this scenario if all of the city guards are defeated, but if we lose this one without actually opening the next area, that does not cause us to lose because I'll tell you right now that there are more city guards in the expanded area later on in this scenario. So, all of the Algox guards have activated. In fact, that is it for the monsters. And now we can look back to the initiative, and the Blink Blade is going to go next at 47. Now, they are going to begin by activating their Cascading Reaction, and they're going to do the bottom action. Now we can see here, this lets them do a move of three, but since they are slow this round, that is gonna be a move of two. Now if this was fast, then when an adjacent ally moved away from them this round, they would add plus one to their movement, but of course the Blink Blade is slow, so that effect is not gonna be in play. This means they have two movement total, but then they are gonna to add to that the effect of their crude boots. Now this says that during your movement, you can add plus one move to any single movement, and then this will become exhausted. This means they get 2 plus 1 or 3 movement total. And with that, they are going to go 1, 2, 3 to jump on top of this difficult terrain log. After that, they can now do the top action for power leak. Now that says this is an attack of 4, and if they are slow, then they are going to muddle themselves for the next round. So obviously that is the power leaking, and if they were fast, they could actually do this at two different targets, but then they would poison themselves and gain one experience. Now, poison means that any future attacks towards you have plus one attack, so fortunately that's not going to happen, but when you are muddled, you have your attacks happen at a disadvantage, which is obviously bad. Either way, that is going to happen to them in the next round's attacks, so for now they can do this attack four, and they are targeting the adjacent Algox Shaman. Well, they of course have to draw the top card from the modifier deck, and nice, that's a plus one, so that means they are actually doing five damage with this power leak attack. So we can look over here and see that the elite Algox Shaman have one shield. So that means they will do five minus one or four damage. And the Shaman is number one. So we can see that it is going to take nine damage total to defeat them. And at this point, we still have to do five more damage. After that, the power leak means they are muddled. So next round, all of their attacks are going to be at disadvantage. So next round, maybe they will prioritize doing other things instead of going for big attacks. Well, Blink Blade is done with their turn, so now in initiative order, we can see that the city guards get to go at 51. Now, they have an attack value of 2, and they always activate with move plus 0, and then attack plus 0. Now, obviously, this city guard is not going to move because they are going to focus on that Algox guard, and whenever you do attacks for these friendly allies like this, you then choose one of the player's modifier decks, and I think let's go with the Deathwalker. The reason for that is because they are the only one that did not have to put extra negative one cards into their deck because of their equipment. So we can draw the top card, and they got a plus zero. That means the city guard will do two plus zero, or two damage, towards Algox guard number two. So we can put this down over there. At this point, it's now time for the Deathwalker to activate. They are at initiative 82, and remember that whenever a figure has summoned something, then those summons will activate first. So that means that this Shadow Beast is going to activate, and we can see it has a movement of 3 and then an attack of 2. So we can look out to the board, and the Shadow Beast is going to focus on this Algox guard, so it is going to move into adjacent range and then do a 2 damage attack with the Deathwalker's attack modifier deck. So they can draw the top card, and it's a minus one. Now that means the Shadow Beast is doing two minus one, or just one damage towards that guard. That means it's still going to take three more damage to take that guard out. Of course, if it hadn't been healed, then it would be dead now, but that pesky shaman got in the way. Now that their summons have activated, they can now do their main actions. Now they're going to go with the top part of Call to the Abyss. Remember, they used the bottom part on their first turn, and then they used their minor stamina potion to bring this back into their hand. Now we can see this says that every time they kill an enemy, they may place one shadow token into the hex where that enemy was. Now this is going to give them two experience immediately, and this is going to stay in their active area for as long as they want. If it ever leaves the active area, then it will be lost for the game. Now they are likely going to leave this out for the entire scenario as they try to kill off the monsters to generate more of these shadow tokens, which they do like using. Either way, they can now take their two experience, which brings them up to three. And it is worth noting that whenever one of your summons kills something, it's as if you killed it. So if the Shadow Beast killed something, then the Call to the Abyss will still activate, putting down a Shadow Token. 
Now, after that, they can then activate the bottom part of the Eclipse card, and this simply gives them a move of two, and then they will infuse the battlefield with Knight Elemental Energy. So they're going to move one, two spaces forward, and with that, their turn is done. Now, they did infuse the battlefield with the Knight Element, so that is going to happen now that their turn is over, which means they can slide this up to the Strong Column. All right, every figure has now activated, so it's now time for the end of round steps. Now, the first thing we do is reduce all of these elements on the board, and then if any character wants to do a short rest, they can, but I think we are all still good. Finally, we can reshuffle up our modifier decks if we see any of that reshuffle symbol, but it doesn't look like any of us have those. And up here, the monster combat deck does not either. Now, we do see that the Shaman card for healing has that symbol, so that means these are going to get shuffled back into the Shaman ability deck. All right, let's now start the next round of the game, and Blink Blade needs to first decide if they are going to be fast or slow. Now, they have decided they are going to spend this token, which means they are going to be fast. So let's focus up here, and we can now discuss our options with our partners around the table. Now, the uh, Deathwalker says that for the first time in the game, they are going to get in on the action. They're planning on doing some attacking, and they are pretty confident that their Shadow Beast is going to take out this Algox guard right here. Now, the Blink Blade is going fast, and they have said that they are hoping that even though they are muddled, that they will be able to do a decent amount of damage towards this Shaman. So in terms of what we are going to do on our turn, well, one thing that jumps out to me is the fact that we are a little bit blocked in for this path down here. As you can see, we have our reinforcements hanging out on that spot, and currently they would take a hit over the Blink Blade, which is pretty good if this Shaman does decide to do an attack early on in the round. Now, I suppose that would only be the case if the tie is broken towards us, so we now have to ask the Blink Blade how fast they are going, and they are anticipating going pretty fast this round. So with that in mind, we can look at the cards in our hand, and we can see that if we want to go faster than them, we probably have to go with something like maybe this 20, the 15, or the 18, at least as one of the two cards that we play. Well, this 18 right here is our only other ranged attack, and considering things are a little bit blocked in here, I think this is a pretty good option for us. Now, it's range 4, so we will definitely have options for targets. Unfortunately, it only does 2 damage, but I still think this is a pretty good pick for us, considering how early it puts us in the round, and hopefully this will be faster than the Blink Blade. Again, they are telling us they are going pretty fast, so we can't know any more details than that, so we are hoping this is faster than that. Now, we do have to pick another card for the bottom action that we are planning on doing. Remember, these are just our plans. We could always change up our uh, ideas once we see all of the initiatives and actually do the bottom action of this card. I'm just anticipating we are going to do the top. So let's look at these options. Now, Regroup says that two allies within range three can perform move three. Now, that means we would not move, but that is a pretty good way to move our allies around the table. This next one is Pincer Movement, and it says we can do a move one and then a loot one. Now, before we move on, I would like to point out up here uh, that this is an interesting attack. You can see all of these colors. Well, we are the gray hex over there, the red are enemies, and the green are allies. So that means if we position ourselves so that there is an enemy directly between us, then we can do this massive attack right here. It's five damage, and it muddles, and it gives one experience for us. Now, similar to that, this Rally and Cry has a slightly different angle, but it lets us do a three damage attack and disarm the target. Now, down here, we could summon a Banner of Strength for our bottom action this turn. That would have all of our allies within range two get plus one attack to one of their attacks each turn. That seems pretty good, but I'm not sure if we want to place that down over here at this point. I think it might be better to save this for the next room that we haven't even gotten into yet. Now, we can see over here we have Deflecting Maneuver, and it says that we would get Shield 2 for the duration of this round, and that shield would only apply to ranged attacks. So this is great if we think we are about to get hit by a bunch of ranged attacks, but at this point, I'm not sure that's going to be the case. Moving on, we have Combined Effort. This uh, top action right here has another pattern. Now, if we are next to one of our allies, both uh, adjacent to an enemy, we could do a 4 damage attack that wounds. Now, as you can see, these combo attacks are very powerful, so hopefully we can make that work with the summons or the other uh, characters out here on the map. Down below, it says we could do a move 2, and then two allies within range 2 can perform move 2. So essentially, we can all move together, and again, this does seem pretty great, but not on this turn. 
Now over here we have a regroup and we've already seen this one already. So I think looking at all of these options, let's go with pincer movement. Now we can move once right up here and loot that token off of the map. Or of course we could just do two movement. It's going to depend on what the map looks like when we actually take our turn. Well, we've all made our decisions, so we can flip these over. We are going at initiative 18. The Death Walker is going at initiative 28. And the Blink Blade is going fast. And we can see they have an initiative of 20. So they are going quite fast, but fortunately, we are slightly faster than them in initiative. Then we can look up here, and the Shaman is going to go at 74. That is very slow. It's not going to move much, but this is a more powerful attack than normal. Next up, the Archer has initiative 31, and they are doing just a move plus zero, attack plus zero. And the Guard up here has an initiative of 35, and oh, that's interesting. They are going to move a little slower than normal, and they do a regular attack, but they do it at range two. Remember, the Guards don't normally do ranged attacks, but this ability card will change that for this round. All right, let's now start activating, and it looks like we have the lowest initiative, so we get to go first. Well, I think the situation has not changed, so we are going to do the bottom action here and the top action on Driving Inspiration, and let's start with that. So that is a 2 damage attack towards a target that's within range 4. And when we look back to the map, I think maybe we should actually turn around and target this Algox guard. The Death Walker was thinking that their Shadow Beast would be able to take it out, but I kind of forgot that it got uh, healed in the last round. So it still needs 3 damage to be taken out, so the Shadow Beast might be able to pull that off, but it is far from guaranteed. Now, part of me wants to shoot this Shaman, because it's currently the most powerful enemy on the field, but it does have Shield 1, and this attack is only doing 2 damage, so it's possible we won't actually get any damage in. Now we could, I guess, target this archer over there, but the Death Walker is uh, telling us that they are likely going to move over here and try to do a more powerful attack towards that archer, which might kill it off. So yeah, let's go ahead and attack Algox Guard number one. This means we have to flip the top card from our deck, and we got a minus one. Well, that's going to be two minus one, or just one damage done, which means that Guard currently has five damage total. Well, that's finished off this attack, although before we move on, I just realized that we of course do have to activate our reinforcement before we do anything, if we want to do anything. Now we do have control of the reinforcement, but I do think we're going to leave it over here. Well, next up we can do a move 1 and a loot, or we could do a move 2. Now move 2 does not look like it's going to do much for us, so let's just go right here for 1 and loot all of the tokens off of the board within one range of us. So we can pick this up right here, and that means we are going to draw the top card from the loot deck, and it looks like we have found some wood. So we can put this down over here. And with that, we are done with a relatively low impact turn. Uh, hopefully that one damage we did is going to be worth it on that guard. Now we did infuse the battlefield with some light element energy, so that can go all the way up to the strong column. Next up, we can see that Blink Blade is going to go. They are currently fast, so that means they are at initiative 20. Now that means they can do these actions right over here. And they've decided to start with Blurry Jab. Now that is a 3 damage attack, but when they are fast, that becomes a 4 damage attack that wounds and generates 1 experience for them. Now remember, they will do this wound even if they do 0 damage, which is important considering they are currently muddled. That of course means they are at a disadvantage on all attacks this round, so that means they have to draw two combat modifiers and go with the worst one. So they can perform this attack, and they only have one target in melee range, which is the Elite Shaman. This means they can perform that four damage attack, and again, they are muddled, so they will draw this card, which is a plus zero, and a minus one. So they have to go with the minus one, because that is worse, so that means they are doing three damage with this attack, and then they are wounding. Well, remember, this is an elite shaman, so it has shield 1. So instead of doing 3 damage, they will do 2 damage. That means this elite shaman currently has 6 damage on it total, which would be enough to kill off a regular shaman, but not an elite one. So we still have to do 3 damage, and then it is wounded. After that, Blink Blade is going to get 1 experience. Next up, they can do the bottom action for Overdrive. That says they are going to muddle all target enemies within range 2. If this was a slow activation, they would actually do it at range 3. So sometimes these actions are better when Blink Blade is slow. Now at the moment, the only enemies within range 2 are these two right here. Uh, it's possible that this one is going to die before the end of the round. So instead of doing this muddle action, they could just move twice. 
Now we do get to see that the Deathwalker is going to activate before any of these enemies. So if the Blink Blade muddles this Algox guard and then it immediately dies, well then that did not actually do all that much for us. Now, we can also see that this Shaman is currently planning on attacking our Summon. Now, with that in mind, we don't terribly care that the Shaman is doing more damage than normal. So I think with all of that considered, Blink Blade is just going to move 2 with this action. This means they can go 1, 2, and that has another benefit in that if this Algox Guard activates, which it looks like they likely will, they will focus on Blink Blade instead of this City Guard that is just 1 damage away from being killed. Of course, Blink Blade does not have a lot of health either, but we have more control over that character, so I think this is still probably for the best. Next up, it's time for Death Walker to go at initiative 28. Now, before they do any actions, their Shadow Beast will activate. It has a movement of 3 and does 2 damage. Well, we can see it is certainly going to focus on this Algox guard right here. So the Death Walker can draw a card from their Attack and Modifier deck, and the Shadow Beast has done 2 damage. Well, our turn did seem relatively low impact doing that one damage over here, but because we did that, the two damage from the Shadow Beast is going to be just enough to defeat that Algox guard. So we can remove all of this damage. Then the guard will be removed from the map, and we can put a loot token down. And then finally, the Deathwalker's Call to the Abyss active action says that each time they kill an enemy, they place a shadow token down onto that hex. So they can put this right over here, because again, whenever their minions kill something, it's as if they did for the purpose of these abilities. Next up, Deathwalker can do one of these two actions, and you'll notice that both of the top action options lets them consume Night Elemental Energy, which is currently waning in the air, so it is usable. Now, they've decided to go with the uh, bottom part of Call of Doom first, so they're simply going to move three times. We can see if they had done the top part, that would have let them do an attack two that would have targeted all adjacent enemies, and they would have performed that attack as if they were occupying a hex with a shadow token. Uh, either way, they are not doing the top, so they are just going to move three times, which means they can go one, two, three. That's finished this card, and now they're going to do the top part of Black Barrage. This is an attack 2 at range 4, and if they consume Night Elemental Energy, then they gain 1 to their attack. So this is actually an attack 3 at range 4. And at this moment, they've decided they would also like to use their Circlet of Eyes item that they've had all game long. Now this says during your single target ranged attack, you can gain Add Target. Now this is a once per scenario use item, and when you add a target, you simply do that same attack towards a different target that is still within range. In this case, they are going to target the Algox Shaman and this Algox Archer. Now, they are going to begin by hitting the Archer. So, they can draw this card, and... Ooh, wow! <laughs> so, they were already doing 3 damage, so this means they are doing 5 damage, and they're now wishing that they decided to target the Shaman first with this attack. Now, as you can see, that Archer only needed 2 damage to die, so that 5 damage is going to very much overkill it. We can remove all of these tokens now and then remove the archer, we can put a loot token down, and then of course the uh, Deathwalker was able to kill off that monster, so they will generate another shadow token with their Call to the Abyss active action. Next up, they will do a 3 damage attack towards this Algox Shaman, and let's see if they get so lucky this time, and that's still pretty good. So that is 4 damage total, but we can see the Shaman has a single shield. So that is 3 damage coming in, and they already had 6 damage, so that is exactly what we needed in order to kill the Algox Shaman. Now it's worth noting that if the Deathwalker had done 1 less damage, then that would not have killed the Shaman, but it would have died from this wounding at the start of its turn. Either way, we don't have to wait for that, and since the Deathwalker killed this uh, monster, they once again get another Shadow Token out onto the board. Well, this has been a really explosive turn for the Deathwalker. We can put this right over there, and things are looking a lot more peaceful over here. So, Deathwalker is done with this action, although I do need to show that they have used the Knight Element, so they can consume it, bringing it down to the inert column, and with that, they are fully done with this attack. This means we can move on, and the Archer would have activated at 31, but they were all killed off. After that, the guards will activate, and there is still one guard over here. It looks like they are going to do a movement at minus one, and then they will do a ranged two attack. Their movement is normally three, so that means they only have two movement. Well, there is currently only one Algox guard out here, and it is going to find focus on Blink Blade, because they break the tie of initiative, having gone before the city guard. 
Now, unfortunately for the Algox guard right here, they are going to be doing a ranged attack at disadvantage because they are adjacent to their target. Now, the reason for that is because they don't have the ability to move out of the way and not be adjacent. You may have noticed this spot right here. Well, this is technically a closed door to the next area, and closed doors act as walls for the monsters. Now, doors can only be opened by our friendly characters, so at this point, that means the Algox Guard will do a 3 damage attack towards Blink Blade. They will draw two cards because, of course, they are at disadvantage. <laughs> and, well, it looks like even with disadvantage, they were still going to be doing 3 plus 1 or 4 damage total. Well, that is quite a bit of damage. It'll knock Blink Blade down to 2. They could have lost one card from their hand or two from their discard pile instead of taking that four damage, but they think they are okay. They have a minor healing potion to heal up three times on their next turn, and they do also have a uh, healing card in their hand still. That's finished up the Algox guard activations. So the final thing to activate is this one city guard right here, who is going at initiative 51. Now they are doing two damage with a melee attack, so they don't have to move. They will focus on this Algox guard right here, and let's draw the top card from the Deathwalker's modifier stack, and unfortunately, they hit the Null. So that means the City Guard does no damage with this attack. Well, that's finished out all of the activations for this round, which means we can lower the elements on the board, and now each player can decide if they want to do a short rest. I think at this point, we are still all fine, so we are not going to do that, which means the last thing we have to do is shuffle up any of these modifier decks that has that symbol. So we can add that right over here. And then finally, we don't have any reshuffling to do up here on any of these monster stacks. This means it's time for the next round, and Blink Blade must go slow, considering they don't have any tokens to remove to go fast. Now, after that, we could all choose to long rest if we want to, but I think everyone is going to not be doing that, so we can now choose two cards from our dwindling hands. So let's look up here and now discuss the situation with our companions. Now we know there is just one Algox guard over here and it does need five damage to be taken out. And then someone needs to go to this door in order to open up the next zone. Now whenever a new area is opened up, all of the enemies in that area will then have a chance to activate. So I'm not sure if it makes sense to open it on this turn or maybe we should do it on the next turn. Either way, when we look at these options here, before we really have time to look at what we can do damage-wise, the Deathwalker has informed all of us that they are going to obliterate this Alcox guard right here. Uh, the only way that does not happen is if they draw their Null card, which is a pretty low chance. Uh, now, the Blink Blade has said, well, they will load up a attack just in case that misses, so they are pretty well set up over there, so I think maybe let's just try to move, and we also have a heal in our hand, so I think maybe now is a good time to activate that. Now it says we can heal two and then regenerate. Uh, regenerate adds one health to a character at the beginning of their turn, but goes away once that character takes damage. Now uh, currently Blink Blade has taken quite a bit of damage, so I think we will want to move in order to get within range two of Blink Blade. So let's just go ahead and use one of these other cards in our hand, like this Rallying Cry right here. Yeah, that'll work. We'll just use it for the move two. None of these other move actions look particularly appealing right now. Well, we are all ready, so we can reveal cards. We are going to go at initiative 20. Deathwalker is going to go at initiative 14. Uh, they've been pretty slow most of the game, but they do have some fast cards. And then Blink Blade is going slow, so it looks like they are at 71 initiative. Now, when we look over here to the monster cards, currently the only type of monster out here is this Algox Guard. That means we will only flip over the ability cards for the Algox Guard monster type. Well, it looks like this could be pretty nasty. The guard has one shield. They aren't going to move, and they will do a plus zero attack towards an adjacent enemy of theirs that also adds poison. Now, poison is a pretty pesky condition. Once it's on a character, it can only be removed with a heal, and when you heal that character, it just removes the poison and does not actually heal any health on that character. Now, the poison will stick around until it gets healed off, and every time the character that has poison gets attacked, that attack has plus one to its damage. Well, we can see the guards are going very fast at 15 initiative, but fortunately for us, the Deathwalker is a little bit faster at 14 initiative. 
Now, it is worth noting that if a character ties in initiative with a monster, then the character always breaks that tie, so even if this was a 15, we would have been fine. And it's also worth noting that if we tied with one of the other player characters, then you look to the other card to break that tie, and if there is still somehow a tie, then players can choose which will go first. Either way, the Deathwalker will go first, but before they activate either of these, they of course can activate their Shadow Beast summon. Well, it's currently way over here, and it has three movement. Now, it's obviously going to focus on this Algox guard, and the way it can get as close as possible is by going one and then two, three, climbing on top of this difficult terrain. Remember, difficult terrain takes two movement points every time you enter one difficult terrain hex. Next up, the unfortunate Shadow Beast does not do any attacks because they only hit in melee and they are not in range to do an attack. Next up, the Death Walker can activate and they're going to go with the top action on Anger of the Dead. Now this starts off pretty simple, it says an attack 2 at range 2, but then down below it says they can remove any number of shadows within range 2 of themselves. For every shadow they remove, they can add plus 2 attack and plus 1 range, and they will gain 1 experience. Well, they have positioned themselves very well at the moment, because currently there are 3 of these shadow tokens within range 2 of themselves. So they are going to remove all 3 of these, and each one, remember, adds 2 to the attack and 1 to the range. So that means instead of being 2 attack and 2 range, this is now 8 attack, 5 range. Now that city guard only needs 5 damage to be defeated, so only a miss is going to stop this, and they got a plus 2. Well, this is a monster attack, that is 8 plus 2, or 10 damage that they are doing right now. And that would actually have been enough to destroy this Algox guard, even if it was at full life. Now you can see that the Algox guard is within range, because it's 1, 2, 3, 4 away from the Deathwalker, so that is definitely going to destroy the Algox guard. And then a loot token will go down in its place, and Call to the Abyss will summon another shadow token out onto the board. Lastly, they will get one experience for every shadow token they removed for this Anger of the Dead top action. We know they removed three, so that is three experience, which brings them up to six. With one action done, they can now do the bottom action of Forceful Spirits, and this says that they can teleport to a hex with a shadow token, or to a hex that is adjacent to a shadow token. Well, currently there's just one shadow token on the board, and if they teleport onto that spot, they could loot that. However, if they teleported onto this door, then they would immediately open it, and that would reveal the next part of the map. In this case, Deathwalker is feeling adventurous, and they've decided it's time to see what the next room looks like. So they're going to teleport right over to this spot here, and the moment they enter this door location, it will open for free... So let's look back to the scenario guide, and you'll notice that door has a 1 on it. Now it says over here that when door number 1 is opened, we are going to read the section number 1 from the next page. Well, we can see over here, this is what the new area looks like that we are going to have to set up, and then before we do that, we can read this section here. It says that you run inside the gate, and the breadth of destruction becomes quickly apparent. The town has been sacked. Smoke and carnage and heat burns your eyes. Buildings have been opened up, their simple wooden walls rammed through, and their contents dragged out and smashed. Barrels, dishes, chests, everything has been hurled out and dashed to bits. What structures still stand are bright with fire, and those that don't smolder. Their frames like black, scorched skeletons. And all about are these creatures, these sources of havoc, howling in the chaos. A new enemy, the Algox. Finally, down here, we have a new special rule, and it says that when all of the enemies are dead, the scenario is complete. So, it's now time to add this new area, along with all of the new enemies, city guards, and pieces of terrain. Now, it's worth noting that each enemy tells us if it is going to be summoned based off of the player count. You'll notice there are three points on each of these icons. The point pointing up to the top left is for a two-player game, the top right is for a three-player game, and the point on the bottom is for a four-player game. Now, we are playing a three-player game, so we can look over here and see that this Algox guard right here is going to actually be elite because the top right corner is gold. If this was a two-player game, then it would have been a regular Algox guard. Now, we can also see that this archer over here is not even going to be in this game because both the top left and top right are black. So in a three-player game, this is black, which means we don't summon that specific monster out onto the board. Well, here is what it looks like just inside the gates of Frosthaven. You can see the piles of rubble, some tables out here, as well as loot that we could just pick up. 
Now, in addition to that, there are a bunch of Algox, and we have to defeat all of them to win. And fortunately, there are three more city guards coming in from the back to help us out. Now, if you remember at the start of this initiative phase, we only drew cards for the Algox guards, because at the moment, those are the only ones out here. Now that we have the other type of monsters out here, we can then reveal cards for them. So we can draw the top one for the archers, and then we can also draw one for the shaman, because there is a shaman right over here. Now, at this point, the Deathwalker can finish out their turn, and after that, we will once again look to the initiatives and activate on the lowest initiative that has not gone yet. Well, after that bold teleportation, the Deathwalker is actually done with their turn, which leaves them pretty vulnerable over here. Perhaps they should not have done this just yet, but either way, we do have to deal with the decisions of our companions around the table. Now, at this point, they are done with their turn, so we can look out to the initiatives. Now, we can see that we are going to go on 20, the Blink Blade will go on 71, and then over here, the guards now activate at 15. You'll notice that there are three of them, and fortunately for us, they don't do any moves. They are just going to shield one, and then do an attack with poison on an adjacent enemy. Now, currently, none of these have any adjacent enemies, so we can just move on from the guards, and now the archers are going to go at initiative 16. So, let's focus in, and you'll notice there are three guards out here on the map. Now, one of them is elite, and we always activate elites first. Of course, if there are multiples, we go in ascending order. So, this value 2 elite Algox archer is going to focus on the Deathwalker here, and they are 1, 2, 3, 4 range away from that archer. So we can look over here, and the Elite Archers have a range of 5, so they certainly are not going to need to move at all in order to get in range. Fortunately, the Archers are just moving fast and not attacking hard this round, so they have a minus 1. But the Elite Algox Archers do start with a base attack of 4, so that's 4 minus 1 or 3, which could still be a significant attack. So let's draw their combat modifier, and they got minus 1. Now that is certainly good, so that means instead of doing 3 damage, they are doing 2 damage which will knock our rather frail Deathwalker down to 4 health. After the Elite Archers have activated, the lowest regular Archer will go. Now they are currently 1, 2, 3 range away from the Deathwalker, and the regular Archers have a range of 4. So they certainly don't have to move, and they have a base attack of 3. So they can draw the top card, and it's plus 0. So that means they are doing 3 damage towards the Deathwalker, which is going to bring them down to just 1 health. Finally, this archer number 3 will attack the Deathwalker. They will flip over this card, and they are doing 3 plus 0, or 3 more damage. Well, I think this is a good example as to why you maybe don't barge into a new room with your most fragile character. Uh, so at this point, the Deathwalker only has 1 health left. That means if they took 3 damage, they would become exhausted. So they are going to lose one of the cards that they have in their hand in order to mitigate all of the damage coming in. In this case, they've decided to go with Restless Souls. We can see that that would have given them the ability to have all allies and enemies adjacent or occupying hexes with shadows to suffer a damage, and the bottom would have let them move their shadow tokens up to two spaces. Uh, that would have been nice, but they've decided this card is going to be lost. At this point, the archers are done, and next up in initiative order will be us at 20. Now, we were planning on just moving twice and then doing this heal plus regenerate action, so let's go for it. Now, we can, of course, activate our reinforcement first, so let's have them move twice. They will go one, two, right over there, and then we will move two spaces onto that loot token. Next up, we can do our heal at range two, and unfortunately, the Deathwalker is three range away. So, there are many reasons why the Deathwalker probably should have teleported onto this spot and not opened up the door, but either way, we are going to try to make this work anyway. Now, we do have the Blink Blade in our range, and they have taken quite a bit of damage as well. So let's heal them for 2, and then also give them the regenerate effect. Well, that heal 2 will bring them back up to 4, and since I am playing with a prototype of Frosthaven, we don't actually have the token for rejuvenate, so I'm going to take this 1 damage token and put it into the condition area to remind us that before the Blink Blade activates, they can heal 1 health, and remember, this will stick around until Blink Blade takes their next damage. So that's finished out our turn, and we are on a spot with a loot token, so we can pick that up and then draw the top card from the deck to see what it was, and it looks like it was a coin. Next up in initiative order, the Shaman will activate. There's currently just one of them, and they are regular, so they are not elite. We don't have to worry about that pierce anymore. 
Now we can see that they're going to move and then try to do a heal. Fortunately, none of the current Algox have taken any damage, so that heal will not do anything. Now whenever a monster moves and does not have an attack, then they are going to move as if they were going to do a melee attack on their focus. Now we can look out here and see that this shaman is one, two, three, four, five spaces away effectively from this city guard. Now you may have noticed I counted two for this, and that's because this rubble is difficult to rain, much like that log we saw in the other room. Now it's worth noting these tables and this pile of rocks over here are both obstacles that you cannot move through. Now we can see that the shaman is one, two, three, four, five, six spaces away from the death walker. So that means that this city guard is technically closer. So the shaman is going to move two plus zero spaces. So that will be two spaces bringing them over there. After that, they obviously do not do a heal because they have no targets that need that healing. So let's move on in initiative order and blink blade is at 71. So that means the city guards will activate at 51 first. Now at this point we have four of them out here and they will continue to activate in ascending order. We can see this city guard we've had by our side all game long is number one. So they are going to go first. They have a move plus zero, attack plus zero, and their move is currently two. So they are going to focus on that Algox archer who is definitely closer to them. So that means they will move two spaces and then do a two damage attack towards that archer. In this case, let's continue drawing from the Death Walker's stack. Remember, we are doing this because both of the other characters have more of those negative one cards in their deck because of the equipment that we pulled. So that City Guard is going to draw this card, and that is unfortunate. They got a minus one. So they're going to do two minus one or one damage towards that Algox Archer. That was Archer number three, so we can add that over here. And now City Guard number two can activate. Now it's worth noting that when we put these tokens out, we put them out randomly with their numbers, and we can see that 2 is here, 3 is there, and 4 is there. So I kind of accidentally made them go in clockwise order, at least with their starting positions. So this city guard is going to focus on that Algox guard, and it's going to move 2 spaces, then it's going to do a 2 damage attack, and we will once again draw from the Death Walker's stack, and they got a plus 1. Nice! So that's 2 plus 1, or 3 damage. Now we can see that's Algox guard number 2. So we can put the damage down onto the two part of the sleeve. Moving on, city guard number three will go. Now they are going to try to find focus, and this shaman is one, two, three, four spaces away for them to get in melee attack range, whereas this Algox guard is one, two, three, four, five. That means city guard number three will focus on this Algox shaman and move two spaces and then obviously not do an attack. Lastly, City Guard number four is going to focus on that Shaman as well, and they will go one, two spaces to also try and get closer, but unfortunately, neither one of these got to do any attacks in their first round activation. At this point, it's time for the final activation of the round, which is the Blink Blade at 71. So the first thing that happens is the Regenerate Condition will heal them up one damage, so they are now at five out of their maximum of eight. After that, they have a decision to make. Now, they were originally planning on doing this with the bottom action for Drive Recharge that would have healed them twice. It only goes to themselves because it says self, and since they are currently slow, that would have actually been a heal of four. Now, at this point, they can only heal up to three before they hit their maximum, and then they just had this hit and run attack ready in case they needed it. Well, that would have let them do a two damage attack and then a two minus one or one move. And moving is a little nice out on the board, but now they are considering maybe doing this instead. Now, the top part of Drive Recharge lets them take another one of these counters, which of course let them go fast. And in general, the Blink Blade is more effective at doing damage when they are fast. Now, if they do that, then they will activate the bottom part of Hit and Run, and that does seem pretty interesting. It says, on your next five attack actions while you are fast, you perform a move three as the final part of that action. Now, you'll notice these experience points over here. That means on the third and fourth activation of this card, you generate one experience each time. Well, extra movement will let them get around this battlefield quicker, so they've decided they are going to go with this other plan. Again, they were planning on doing this first, but things are a little bit different now that we have a new map out here. So they are going to gain one fast counter, which they can put right over here, and that means their next two turns could be fast if they want to. After that, they are going to bring the bottom part of Hit and Run over into their active area. 
Now they can take one of their tokens and put it right over here. And this is going to stay here until it has been activated five times. So essentially on their next five fast attacks, they get a bonus plus three movement, which really could be very effective for trying to mitigate damage towards the Blink Blade and also just getting the Blink Blade in range to keep hitting those opponents. At this point, the last thing Blink Blade will do is use their minor healing potion. That is going to give them a heal three once. That is going to be gone for the rest of the scenario, and that will bring them back to their maximum health of eight. At this point, we've done all of the activations for the round. So at the end of the round, we can have all of the elements move down once, and this means they are all inert once again. The next thing that happens is all players can decide if they want to do a short rest or not. Now, the Death Walker isn't, but I think we probably should. We only have these two cards in our hand, so if we don't do a rest, then these will be the two that we play, and I just don't think they are going to help us out with the current situation. Now this does mean that we are resting one round before we could have, which means we are technically exhausting ourselves a little bit more than we could be doing, but I think at this point we need to be somewhat bursty and we need to get into the fray. We can take the most damage and we can place out those uh, banner summons onto the field, and at the moment we are lagging way far behind our companions. So I think let's go ahead and do a short rest. That means we are going to shuffle up our discard pile. Uh, we have to do this hidden, of course, and then randomly we are going to lose one of these cards. Now, in this case, we are going to lose this one, and that is a bummer. This is the one that let us uh, wound adjacent things, and obviously wounding is great. And it also has an option to summon a Torchbearer, which is a wounding summon. You know what, I just don't think we want to lose this card. So instead, we can put it into our hand, we can take one damage, and then we can randomly lose another card from our hand, and this time we have to deal with the consequences of it, and it is our move and loot. That is okay overall, I think. We can put this over here, it's a pretty slow initiative card, and then the rest of our cards will go back into our hand. Over here, the Blink Blade has also decided to do a short rest, so they are going to randomly lose one of these cards right here, and it is Overdrive. Uh, that is a pretty cool card overall. It lets you gain shields for the entire round if you go slow, and you gain Retaliate 2 for the entire round if you go fast. It also gave them the option of muddling a bunch of enemies out on the field. Well, I think they're going to lose this and not suffer a damage because of it, so the rest of their cards will go back into their hand. This means the final thing we have to do is reshuffle our combat decks, but none of the player combat decks have to be shuffled. And then when we look up here, the monster combat deck does not have to be shuffled. Uh, currently, they have gone through just about half of it, so in here there is still a null and that 2x damage which we are so scared of. Now over here, there is a reshuffle icon for the Algox guards. And then after that, we also see a shuffle icon over here for the Algox shaman. At this point, we can start the next round off, and before anything happens, Blink Blade needs to decide if they want to go fast or slow. Now, they have two of these tokens, so if they go slow, they are not allowed to put another one down. Remember, they can have up to five of these tokens up here, but only two can be put down by taking slow actions. So instead, they have decided they are going to go fast, and now we can all figure out if we want to play two cards or long rest. Well, we are certainly going to play cards as well as Blink Blade, and it looks like the Death Walker also wants to play cards. They have three in their hand, and they don't want to do a long rest at this point. So let's now start discussing the round. Now, we have a lot of options available to us, but one thing that jumps out to me is the fact that we have our Incendiary Throw back online. Remember, this is a range 3, 1 damage attack that will wound uh, the enemy that it uh, damages and all adjacent enemies. So we could use that in order to hit this cluster right down here. Now, while we are talking about the possibility of wounding these over here, Blink Blade has said that with their fast actions, they are going to run into this room, wound a couple of these different uh, monsters, probably not these two down here, and keep moving. So they're going to have a really big, fast turn. Now, the Death Walker is not going to have a big fast turn. Instead, they are going to try and pull back a bit and heal up, because right now they have just one health, which is definitely a problem. They can obviously do a lot of damage from range. They also have some uh, melee attacks that can be pretty strong, but for the moment, they need to pull back so that the rest of us can get over here in the front. So with all of that in mind, I think we should plan on doing this incendiary throw, especially when you consider we are way back over here, and I don't think we're going to be able to move into range to do a melee attack on anything this round. So if we use this with an uh, initiative of 22, I think we then need to move as fast as possible. 
Now we have a move four right here, and we have another move four, and I think that is the best moves that we have available. Now this one is at initiative 67, and that one is 21. So we could pair these up right there, so we would go on at 22 and be fast later on. But if we did that, we would be losing out on this tip of the spear action. Now that is a three damage, three pierce attack, but in order to pull this off, we need to have an ally right behind us, and then we attack two enemies in a straight line. Now that could be great, although at this moment, none of the enemies out here have pierce. So this is situationally much better in other scenarios versus other monsters that have the shields. So I think in the current case, this isn't too powerful. Now actually, I just realized this shaman has a single shield, but I don't think that pierce three is really going to be worth it. So I think let's use these two cards here, and that will save this fast card that we could potentially use to not move, but do a three damage range three attack later on. So we will go at initiative 22 because I do think we want to go as fast as possible. Now that we've all made decisions, we can flip these over. We are going at 22. Deathwalker is going at 26. Blink Blade is fast, and it looks like they're going at 19. Then we can see the Shaman is going to activate at uh, 89. Uh, they are going to move very slowly, heal uh, all adjacent allies, and then bless themselves. Now that certainly isn't good, considering this Blessing will put a, a Blessing card into that deck, which will double the damage that a monster does when this is pulled out. After that, we can reveal the Archer card, and the initiative is 32, and then finally the guards are just guarding at 50. Well, it looks like all three of the player characters are going to go before any of the monsters, which is probably a good thing. Uh, either way, we can start off with Blink Blade over here, and they want to do the bottom action for Blurry Jab. That is a move three, and since they are fast, that gets two extra movement, so they actually get five move with this action. With this, they are going to go one, two, three, four, five. And then they're going to do the top action for Cascading Reaction. Now this is a very powerful action, and you'll notice after they do this, they will lose the card permanently for the rest of the scenario. Now uh, they still think this is worth it, so they are going to do an attack 3, and since they are fast, they are going to wound with this attack, and then get 1 experience point. So let's see how this attack goes, and that is a great start for their turn. So that is 3 plus 2, or 5 damage, which is going to hit Algox Archer number 2. Now that was an elite Algox Archer, so that 5 damage did more than half of the damage that we need to defeat it. In addition to that, the Cascading Reaction means they are wounded, and then Blink Blade gets an experience. Next up on their Cascading Reaction, we can see they get a move 3. If they were slow, this would be a move 1, but they are currently fast. So they're going to use this to go 1, 2, and they've actually decided to stop right there. After that, they do another Attack 3, which will wound because they are fast. Well, let's see if they get as lucky again, and they didn't. Uh, they're still going to do 3, minus 1, or 2 damage here, and that targeted Algox guard number 1. Fortunately, that guard is normal, so that is 2 out of the 7 damage we need to defeat it, and it is wounded. Next up, they will get another experience for that second attack, so that's going to bring them up to 4, and now they can activate hit and run. This says on their next five attack actions while fast, they perform a move three as the final part of that action. Now, I guess, actually, they did two attack actions here, so technically they should have had move three plus move three between those two attacks, but they did not need that. But that does mean they should have used the charge for the first attack. Now, with this second attack, they're going to use this charge again, and you are forced to use these charges whenever you are able. So they can now move three more times. And with this, they've decided to go one, two, three. Oops, I just realized we discarded Cascading Reaction when this actually becomes a Lost, so it should be right over here in their Lost pile. With Blink Blade's turn done, we can now look back to the initiatives, and we get to go next at 22. Well, the first thing we can do is move our summoned reinforcement up to two times, and remember, we can control this. Uh, we summoned this so that it would soak up an attack, but so far, they've not actually been hit yet. Well, let's have them go one, two spaces right over here. And now let's move four times. So that means we can go one, two, three, four, and jump right over our summon. And then we can use our incendiary throw. Remember, this has a range of three, and we can see that this elite Algox guard is one, two, three spaces away from us. So let's target them. 
Now, this is a one damage attack, and in order to do the wounding, we have to do at least one damage. So that means the null or the minus one would stop it, and we got lucky. Nice. So that's a plus one, which means we do two damage. And it looks like that went towards Algox guard number three. So we can put that down right over there, and because we did at least one damage, they are now wounded. And then on top of that, all adjacent enemies are also going to become wounded, so that is going to be Algox archer number one. So let's put this down right over here. Well, that has finished up our turn, so next up in initiative order is the Deathwalker at 26. Now before they do either of these actions, their Shadow Beast will activate. It has a movement of 3, and it appears it is going to try and focus on, well, this Algox Guard, I think. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 movement away, versus that one being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 movement. So yeah, it is going to go one, two, three spaces and stop right over here. And then it tries to do a two value attack, but obviously there are no adjacent enemies for it to hit. Now Deathwalker can go and they're going to start with the Wave of Anguish. Now the bottom action right here says they get a move two and then they can move all shadow tokens up to one hex. Now this is important when you consider the fact that Rest in the Shade says they will heal twice, but this only affects themselves and allies currently on hexes with shadows. Obviously, they are not currently on a shadow, so they are going to move twice right over here, and then they will move all shadow tokens up to one hex. Well, there's currently only one shadow token because they consumed the rest of them, and they will move this onto their hex so that the rest in the shade will heal them twice, and everyone else would get a heal of two if they were on a shadow token, but currently that is not the case. So Deathwalker will now heal, which means they're going to go back up to three health. Now I just realized they have a multicolored cloak item down here, which they could have used before, uh, but I forgot. <laughs> uh, this says that when attacked, they can create any element. Now uh, it's possible that it was not actually good to use this in the past turn when the Deathwalker got attacked so much, but we do want to keep this in mind in the future when we might need an element to activate a good ability. Um, now, either way, we can see that Deathwalker did infuse the battlefield with the Knight element, and I just realized I forgot to infuse the battlefield with the Fire element as well at the end of our turn. So, Fire should be up here, and so should Knight. Well, it's now time to look at initiatives again, and the Archers are going to go next. They are at 32, and there is an Elite Archer, so it is going to activate first. Now, it is Archer number 2, and they are wounded, so they are going to take 1 damage, and then we can see they have a move plus zero, then an attack plus one at minus one range. Now, the elite Algox archers have a standard range of five, so that means they're at four. And when we look out to the map, they can uh, focus on this city guard because they are only three range away. That is the closest out of all the rest of these. It looks like uh, Blink Blade, this city guard, and the uh, Banner Spear, us over there, we are all at four range. So the archer is going to target city guard number two, and they are doing it at plus one damage, so that is five damage. So that means they can draw the top card, and it's a zero, so five damage is not great. However, remember that city guards have one shield. This means, fortunately, they are going to take five minus one, or four damage, which is important considering five damage will defeat them. Now remember, we are going to lose this scenario if all four of the city guards die, and two of them are one health away from dying, which is a pretty big problem for us. Uh, now we of course have to kill off these monsters, but maybe we should try and prioritize uh, saving some damage on these city guards as well. Now this is especially relevant when we consider that Blinkblade decided to go there at the end of their turn, and if they had gone here, they would have been three range away just like this guard, and they would have broken the initiative tie. Now, obviously, taking five damage as a character isn't good, but they could have just lost a card and continued on with the uh, overall scenario, whereas if the city guards die or take lethal damage, there's nothing we can do about it. Now, we could try to heal them, but we don't have that many heal actions amongst all of the characters. So either way, Blink Blade is here, and we can now move on. So the archers are going to keep activating, and now the normal ones will go. Archer number one will activate first, and they are going to focus onto us. We are one, two, three, four range away, and normally their range is four. However, uh, the range is minus one right now, so it's three. That means they do have to move, and they have a regular movement of two, so they are going to move just one space over there so that we are now in range. And now they are going to do a three plus one or four damage attack, and it's a five damage attack. Wow. 
Now, taking five damage would be pretty bad at this point. Uh, we have eight health, and I don't think we want to take all five. So instead, we could lose two cards from our discard pile or one from our hand, and I think that is probably what we should do. Um, I'd hate to lose any of these cards overall, but I think at the end of the day, this combined effort is probably not worth it. It is a four damage attack, but it wounds, and right now, it looks like about half of the monsters on the board are wounded, actually more than half, so you can't double wound them. So let's go ahead and lose this one, and that will mitigate all five damage that was coming in. Finally, this archer is going to go. They are going to focus on the city guard number one that is adjacent to them. So they are going to move away so they don't do this attack at disadvantage. And then they are doing three plus one or four, ooh, or zero damage. <laughs> that was well-timed right there. Uh, so that means they don't do any damage towards city guard number one. So the Algox archers are done, which means the Algox guards now activate. Now they have a move plus zero and an attack plus zero. And the first one to activate is the Elite one. So it has three movement and it does a four damage attack. In this case, it is going to focus on us. So that means it moves two spaces. And then with this four damage attack, it's going to do three damage. Okay, that is pretty good. Uh, this is getting a little scary considering the uh, 2x damage card is somewhere in the remainder of this monster deck, and there are not that many cards left in there. Uh, fortunately, we are going to do a reshuffle at the end of this round. I just hope that we don't hit that 2x before the end of the round. Either way, we can now take 3 damage, and I don't think we want to lose any cards, so that's going to bring us down to 5. Next up, the regular Algox guard number 1 is going to activate. Now, they are going to focus on this city guard right here. Uh, they have a movement of three, which means they can go one, two, and then they're going to do a three damage attack towards the city guard. So in this case, they have pulled the two X. Okay, uh, well, it ended up happening, and that means they're doing six damage towards this city guard, which is going to be more than enough to kill it, considering they already had four damage. So we can remove all of this damage from the sleeve, which means city guard number two has been defeated. So we can pull them off of the map, and there are three city guards left over here. Well, the last Algox guard is right there, and they are going to hit city guard number two. This is a three damage attack plus zero, so that is three damage, which they will subtract one from because of their shield, but two damage is still enough for them to be defeated. So this is not going super great. That means the city guard number two is also removed from the board, and we really need to defend those last two city guards out there. So that's finished up the Algox guard activations, although I just realized uh, we only performed one of these wounds. All three of these other wounds should have happened. So uh, Algox archer number one should have a damage, and Algox guard number one should have taken a damage along with Algox guard number three. Sorry about that. Well, now that the Algox guards are done, the city guards will activate at initiative 51. Remember, they have a movement of two and a melee attack damage of two. So we can focus over here, and city guard number three is going to go one, two spaces, and they are going to attack the Algox Shaman. Let's go ahead and draw from Deathwalker's stack, and they are going to do two times damage. Uh, well, it's always nice to see these. It would be nice if it happened uh, when multiplying a bigger number than two, but either way, I'm not picky. That is two times two, or four damage right there. Well, that was Shaman number one, so we can put these right over here, and they only take six damage to defeat, so two more damage would do it. That's important to note because the other city guard is right here and they are going to focus on that shaman. They're going to move once and they will draw again from the Deathwalker's deck and they got a zero. All right, that means they do two plus zero or two damage, which is exactly enough to defeat that Algox shaman. I didn't see that 2x coming. It's really nice to have these city guards uh, defeating some of these enemies for us. So they are gone. We can then put a loot token in its place. And this is also great considering the shaman didn't activate. Remember, if it activated, it would have blessed the monster modifier deck by putting another 2x card in there. Uh, this is a one-time use 2x card, but still, not having that in there is definitely a benefit for us. At this point, we can see there will be no more shamans for the rest of the game, so I think I will just remove this from the playing area. Well, that's finished up all of this round's activations, so now at the end of the round, these elements will wane. And then we can all decide if we want to do a short rest. Now, we are certainly not going to do that, considering we did that on our last turn, and neither is the Blink Blade, and the Deathwalker is also not going to do that, even though they have one card. That means they are planning on doing a long rest for their next action. Now, at this point, the final thing we have to do is reshuffle up the modifier decks. It looks like the Deathwalker did get one of those drawn over here, so we can shuffle this deck up. 
And up here, it looks like the monster deck also got one of those. So we can shuffle their deck up as well. After that, we can see that none of their abilities need to be reshuffled. So that has finished out the round. So let's start the new round off. And the first thing that happens is Blink Blade has to decide if they want to be fast or slow. Now they are going to be fast. And then Deathwalker has decided they are going to be doing a long rest. So they are not going to play out any cards. Their initiative is going to be at 99, and they are going to heal up twice, as well as reset all of their items once they get to that 99 initiative. They will also choose one of these cards to lose and then put the rest back into their hand. But we can deal with that once we get to their turn. Now this means uh, we obviously get to choose two cards, and so does Blink Blade. So let's now look up here and decide which cards we want to play. As you can see, we only have five in our hand, and one that jumped out to me is this Rallying Cry. Remember, in order to do this three damage disarming attack, we have to be in this orientation, where we are there, that is our target, and that green is an ally. Well, up to this point, our summon hasn't really done anything, but we can move them right over there, so that we would have that orientation to do this disarming attack. Considering that is the elite Algox Guard and it does 4 damage as a base attack, disarming it is a really good way to mitigate a lot of damage that could come in, and an attack 3 towards them is pretty good as well. Now with that in mind, obviously that's very slow at 71, so let's play a really fast card from our hand. Uh, this one would be pretty good, it would give us plus 2 shields, but those shields would only come into play for ranged attacks coming in. But I think instead, let's go with our driving inspiration to finally summon a banner of hope. I say finally because we are the banner spear, so it makes sense to try and get these banners out. Now this one is a healing banner, and we can probably put it right over there, and going at 18 initiative seems pretty good. Now while we are making these decisions, Blink Blade is also doing the same thing, and they've mentioned to us that they're planning on uh, going pretty fast. They are going to uh, try to do damage to these over here. They're actually going to go very fast. And then they're going to try to do something with these over there as well. We're not really sure how that's going to pan out. But either way, I think we'll go with these cards and at initiative 18. All right, let's reveal. So we can show that we are at 18. Uh, the Blink Blade is at 17 because they are going fast. The Archer is going to go at 29, and they have an immobilizing attack that fortunately does a little bit less damage than normal, and the guards are guarding. <laughs> they are going to move slowly, and that's unfortunate. After their uh, attack, they will strengthen themselves, so in the following round, all of their attacks will have advantage. Well, the first one to activate will be Blink Blade at 17, and they are going to start by doing the bottom part of Twin Strike. Remember, they did the top part the last time we saw this card, but the bottom says they can move three, and then if they are fast, they are going to generate the wind element, and until the end of the round, they will have retaliate two. Now, that means whenever they take damage from melee range, they will do two damage back to the attacker. Now, if they had gone slow, they would have moved slower and actually healed themselves, but they are going fast, and that retaliate could do some good damage overall. So they can start by moving three times. With this move, they're going to go one, two, three, and then they're going to activate the top part of Power Leak. Now, this is going to be an attack four, and since they are going fast, they are going to get to do two targets, and unfortunately, after that, they are going to poison themselves, but they will get one experience. So they can start by attacking this Algox Guard, and that's going to be four plus one or five damage. Nice. Actually, this is more than nice, it's excellent, considering that 5 damage brings Algox guard at number 2 to 8, and they only have 7 life, so that has defeated the guard. So we can remove it from the map, and now they are going to target the Algox archer number 2. Once again, this is a 4 damage attack, and that is not so nice. They got the null, which means they're going to do 0 damage with this attack instead. Now after that, they are going to poison themselves but then they do get one experience, which will bring them up to five. After that attack, they now activate the bottom part of hit and run because they are fast. So this is gonna go here and that's gonna cover up another experience point. So that's gonna bring them up to six and then they get three movement. With this, they've decided to go one, two and stop right here. All right, their turn is over and they did infuse the battlefield with wind elemental energy. So it's now time for us to go at 18. Now, of course, our summon is going to activate first, and it will move two, and we can control it. So it's going to move one, two spaces over there, and then, because we are adjacent to our target, and so is one of our allies, and we're not in a line, we're just one set off like that, we can do this rallying cry attack. 
Now that's a three damage attack that will disarm and get us an experience point. But in addition to that, let's also use our heavy sword. This says during your melee attack, you can add plus one to the attack. Now this is a once per scenario item that we're gonna use. And that means we are now doing four plus zero or four damage. Well, that's still fine overall, I think. Now that was Algox guard number three. So we can put a five and pull one off and we can see they have now taken seven damage total. Next up, very importantly, that guard is disarmed, so they are not going to be attacking this round. Finally, we will get one experience, which brings us up to two, and now let's summon the Banner of Hope. Now, as you can see, that says all allies in range two will perform heal one on themselves at the start of each one of their turns. Now, obviously, this has no attack or move since it's a banner on the ground, and it does have four health. So let's take some summon tokens, and we'll go with the green one for healing. And that is also going to give us two experience, which will bring us up to four. Now, we of course have to bring summons out onto empty adjacent locations to the summoning character, which in this place will be right over here, and there's quite a few summons in this area. Well, that's finished our turn, so now the archers can go. They're at 29 initiative, and they're going to move at plus zero, then attack at minus one at plus one range, and immobilize with this attack. Now, this is the first archer to activate since it is a elite, and it appears it's going to target Blink Blade because they are two range away compared to the three of this city guard and the four of us. Now, before they do anything, they are wounded, so they're going to take one damage. That means they are up to seven, and they are just two damage away from dying. After that, their range is six, and they certainly have Blink Blade within that range, so they can do this four minus one or three damage attack. So in this case, oh no, it's the 2x. All right, well that means they are doing six damage towards the Blink Blade at this point. And on top of this, when you consider they are poisoned, that means they are gonna take another damage. So this is a seven damage attack, which is almost enough to exhaust them right there. So they are certainly going to lose a card from their hand and they've decided to go with experimental adjustment. So they can put that over there to mitigate all of the damage coming in. After that, this attack will immobilize the target which means Blink Blade will not be able to move until the end of their next turn. Next up, regular Algox Archer number one will activate. They are going to focus onto our summoned reinforcement, but since they are adjacent, they do want to move. Now they have a movement of three minus two or two, so they're just gonna go back right over here so they are no longer adjacent, and then they are going to target that reinforcement. They will do a three minus one or two damage attack towards the reinforcement, and that is two damage. Now, this reinforcement only has one health, so that means it will be immediately defeated. And that will also take this card offline. As you can see, there is the one health showing. So after that, this is just going to go into our discard pile, and we could summon a reinforcement again in the future, or use the top action here, which says we could heal three on all allies, and we would suffer one damage for each ally whose hit point value increased. So we would suffer at most two damage, but healing three on both allies could potentially be great. Either way, that is now in our discard pile. And of course, we don't have to immobilize that reinforcement because they are gone. Lastly, Algox Archer number three is going to activate. They are going to target a Blink Blade, and then they're going to try to move because they are currently adjacent and they are doing a ranged attack. Now they have a move of two plus zero. So the monster can look at their options, and if I'm being honest, when the Blink Blade made this turn plan, they thought that they were cornering this archer into not being able to leave because these two spots are difficult terrain, which take two movement to go onto. So they thought they were forcing the archer to attack at melee range, which would have been at disadvantage, and that archer also would have taken two damage for this retaliate because that only works against uh, melee attacks unless otherwise stated. But uh, the Blink Blade did not notice that the archer could move through this guard and then just go right over here. So I think that is what's going to happen. Unfortunately, that's just something that we missed, so there will be no retaliations, and then they are going to do this attack. Well, their base attack is three, and then there is a minus one from this card. So it is currently two, and then plus zero. So that is two damage towards the Blink Blade. But then remember, the Blink Blade was self-inflicted with poison from that power leak. So that adds one more to the attack value, and that means they are currently taking three damage. Now, they have eight life, so three damage isn't that big of a deal. However, they are considering potentially losing a card to mitigate that three damage. 
The reason they would do that is because, remember, they still have this regenerate token on their condition area, and that's only going to go away once they take any damage. Currently, they haven't taken any damage, so that would heal this poison off of themselves at the start of their next turn. Now, that does seem pretty great overall, but they are going to have to go slow on the next turn, so it's possible they would just get attacked before they activated their turn anyway. So I think they are just going to take the damage, so that's going to bring them down to 5, and then, of course, this regenerate is now gone. So that's finished up the archer activations, although I did forget to activate the wound on archer number 1. So they should have taken one damage from that. Moving on, we can see the Algox guards are at initiative 55, which means the city guards are going to go first because they are at initiative 51. Now we can see they each have a movement of two and then a two damage attack. Unfortunately, it does not look like either of them are going to get an attack off this turn. Uh, city guard number three is going to go one, two, and then city guard number four will go one, two. So they are getting closer to the fray, but unfortunately are not actually dealing any damage this round. Next up, the Alcox guards can activate, and the first one will be number three because it is elite. Now they are wounded, so they are going to take a damage, and then we can see they're going to move at minus one. Now we can see their standard movement is three, so they can move up to two times. But as we can see, they are currently adjacent to their focus, which is us, so they are not going to move. Next up, they would do a 4 damage attack towards us, but they are disarmed, so that will be negated. But then the strength and self will happen, so this strength token will go down there. And that will remind us that until this is gone at the end of their next activation, they will do all of their attacks with advantage. After that, normal Algox guard number 1 will activate. They are also wounded. <laughs> These wounds are doing a lot of work for us, which is great. And then they also can move. They are at 3 minus 1, or 2 movement total. And when we look out to the map, it appears I was wrong when I said that Blink Blade's Retaliation won't come into effect, because this guard is going to head right over here, and they are going to attack Blink Blade. Well, that's going to be a 3 plus 0 attack, plus 1 for this poison, so that is 4 damage coming in. Now at this point they have 5 health, so 4 damage would bring them down to just 1, and they feel like maybe it is time for them to lose a card to mitigate this. After looking over their options, they are going to lose this card from their hand. They could lose 2 cards from their discard pile, but they don't want to do that yet. Now they're pretty sad to lose this sap speed. They were hoping to do the bottom part at some point. That says they could stun all adjacent enemies, and then they would gain 1 of their speed counters for each enemy targeted. Now, stun is a really powerful effect. When something is stunned, they don't take any actions for their entire turn. So it's kind of like a disarm plus an immobilize plus not doing anything else that the monster card could potentially have. Either way, they are not going to be able to do that this scenario, so that will be lost to mitigate that 4 damage coming in. Fortunately, this isn't all bad. Their twin strike is currently active. They are currently fast, so they are going to retaliate for 2 damage. It looks like that was Algox guard number one, so they can put a five here and remove three, and it's now at six damage out of the seven that is required to kill it. So that means next round, when it activates, before it does anything else, it will become wounded and then immediately take that damage, which will kill it. Now, technically, they are strengthened, so we can put this token right over here, although it does not look like that is going to matter. Now that the Algox guards are done, Deathwalker can finally activate at initiative 99. Now, just like always, their summons activate first, so that means that their Shadow Beast will go. It has a movement of 3, as we can see, and then an attack of 2. So we can look out to the map, and it's going to focus on this elite Algox guard. So that means the Shadow Beast will go 1, 2 spaces right over there, and then do a 2 damage attack. Once again, let's choose to draw from Deathwalker's modifier deck, and they got a plus 0. So that is 2 plus 0, or 2 damage, coming towards this elite Algox guard. So we can remove three ones and put a five over there, and that means they are at 10 damage. Now they need 12 damage to be defeated, so this wound is not going to be enough by itself. But that does mean if somebody is really fast next round and does at least one damage, then that would be enough before the Algox guard actually did any damage to us. Next up, Deathwalker can do their long rest. That means they will gain two health. They could also reset any of their items that are resettable, but it looks like they have not used this multicolored cloak yet, so that will stay ready to be used, and then they will have to choose one of their discarded cards to lose. Well, considering there are very few shadow tokens currently on the board, they are going to lose rest in the shade. 
Healing is nice, but it only affects themselves or allies on those shadow spots. The bottom is kind of nice. It lets them move shadow tokens up to five hexes. But at this point in the scenario, they feel like this is maybe their weakest card. So they are going to lose that. And that has finished out the final activation for the round. This means we can look over to the element board. We're going to have both of these elements go down to inert, and then wind will become waning. After that, players could choose to short rest, but I don't think anyone will. So the final thing that happens is we have to reshuffle up the modifier decks. Over here, Blinkblade did hit their null, so that has a reshuffle symbol on it. And up here, the monster modifier deck hit that 2x, so that means this will also be reshuffled. Finally, after that, we can see that the archers hit one of those symbols, so we can reshuffle this deck. It looks like they went quite a while without hitting any of those reshuffles. And then after that, we are ready to go into the next round of the game. At this point, we are starting off the next round, although I did just realize that Blinkblade does have to discard this from their active area at the end of the last round, and now they are going to go slow because they don't have any tokens. So they can put this right over here, and I think we are all going to be playing two cards this round. For Blinkblade, they only have two cards as their option, so that is what they will be playing. So let's look at the board state, and we only have three cards available in our hands. Now we have a melee attack, we have a ranged heal, and a ranged attack. And when we look out at the situation and we talk to our companions, uh, the Deathwalker player has told us that um, they are pretty confident that their Shadow Beast will be able to take out this guard. So with that in mind, I think we should probably focus on doing a 3 damage attack, probably towards this archer right there. Um, they still need a few damage to be taken out, although I suppose we could also use this to hit that archer, uh, but the Deathwalker player tells us they are probably going to hit this archer as well. Now, uh, based off of our timing, I think we might end up going first, but either way, I think this is the card for us to pick. Now, that means we have to go with one of these two as our other option. Now, what we could do is play this one, which gives us plus two shields against ranged attacks, which is certainly not bad. We would not move, but I don't think we need to move, and that would save this regroup card for our hand, and we could potentially play this on the next turn if somebody is in a real need of that healing and that regeneration. Um, now, we could try to use this for Blink Blade over there, but we'd have to move and then use that, and I think it would be much better to get this damage in. So, let's go ahead and pick these two, and we'll save this card. Next up, we have to choose our initiative, and I think let's just go as fast as possible. All right, let's see what everybody did. Deathwalker is going at 20. We know that we are going at 15, and Blinkblade is going at uh, 99. <laughs> they are obviously slow, and that was the card they picked. It looks like they are hoping to go very late in the turn order, uh, as late as possible, actually. Now we can flip over the Archer card, and they are going very fast at 16, and then the Guard is going at 15. Now that's interesting, they are going to shield themselves and then do an attack that poisons, and they aren't even going to try to move this round. Well, when we look at the initiatives, we are tied with the Algok guards. Now whenever a player character ties with a monster, the player character breaks that tie, so that means we get to go first. Well, we always activate summons first, although you notice our Banner of Hope does not actually activate, it doesn't do anything. Its effect uh, is something that happens at the start of each ally's turn if they're within range 2 of it. Now this says they, they can heal 1 on themselves, and we are adjacent to the Banner of Hope, so we are certainly within range 2. That means it will heal us once, which will bring us up to 6. Next up, we can activate Deflecting a Maneuver, and that will turn our shields 2 on, but again, that is only for ranged attacks coming towards us. Next up, we can do our Javelin attack, which will be an attack 3 at range 3. Now, when we look at our options, we can't quite reach this archer. They are 1, 2, 3, 4 spaces away. But we can, it appears, hit either of these two. Now, when we look at the Deathwalker's actions, they are going to be moving their shadow token up to 5 spaces, and then they are going to attack uh, adjacent to that shadow token. So that means they could hit either one of these as well. Now, this archer right down here is wounded already, and uh, when they take that wound, they will only need three more damage to be defeated. Now, that means if we attack them and do at least three damage, then they will die before they even do an attack. And when it comes to this archer up here, they are not wounded, and they only have one damage, so it's very unlikely we would be able to defeat them. So I think let's go ahead and target number one, because we have reasonable odds to defeat that archer before they do any damage back to one of us. 
So let's draw the top card from our modifier deck, and that is great. <laughs> Normally you want to see big numbers, but zero is enough because that means we are doing three damage, which will bring archer number one up to five damage, and once again, this wound will kill them before they even get to do the rest of their activation. With that completed, our turn has come to an end, so we can infuse the battlefield with the element of wind. Next up, the Algox guards are going to activate at 15. Now they are going to start by shielding themselves, and then they will do an attack of plus zero that will also poison. Now the first guard is going to be this elite one right over here, and before anything else happens, they are wounded, so that means they are going to take one damage. That will bring them to 11, so they aren't quite dead yet, and remember they are currently strengthened. That means with this attack, they are going to draw two cards and choose the better one, because this gives them advantage. So let's look over here, and they are going to be focusing on our Banner of Hope. <laughs> uh, that's because it activates just before us, so that's going to break the tie. So that means it is going to be attacking that Banner of Hope. Uh, the base attack is four, so they will draw the top card, which is a minus one, and they have advantage because they are strengthened, so that is a plus one. They'll choose the better one of these, and that means they are doing five damage to our Banner of Hope. Now that's unfortunate because they only have four health, so that is going to destroy it, and it was only able to activate once, healing us once, but even that one activation plus absorbing a five damage hit made this Banner of Hope be pretty darn effective. So let's remove it from our active area, and you'll notice it has this X in the bottom right corner, which means this card is now lost. After that attack, this does have poison, so the banner would be poisoned, except that it is destroyed, so that's not going to happen. Now this Algox guard is going to activate, but we will notice that it is wounded. So it's going to take one damage, which means it's now at seven, and seven is the hit points for the Algox guards. So before they can do anything else, they are defeated which means we can put a loot token right over there and then remove all of these tokens from the sleeve. After that, the Algox archers will activate. Now there are three of them, and this first one is the elite one. We can see that it is number two and it is wounded, so it will take a wound, which brings it up to eight wounds, which is just barely not enough to kill it. Now it is going to attack, and we can see it's at minus one attack, but plus one move. Now it will be focusing on this city guard because it is just two range away, so they don't have to move. Their base attack is four minus one, so they are doing three damage with this, and that is going to be five damage, actually. Well, fortunately for us, city guards have a shield, so that means city guard number three will take four damage, and that puts them one damage away from dying. Speaking of dying, it's now time for Algox archer number one to activate, and they are wounded. So they will take one damage, which puts them to six. Six is their health, so that means they are defeated, and we can put a loot token down right here. After that, we can take these off of the sleeve. And finally, Algox archer number three is going to go. Now they are going to be focusing on us because we are just two range away versus the three of Blink Blade, and we would break the tie anyway because Blink Blade is going at initiative 99. So that means we are being targeted. They currently have damage of three minus one or two, so then they are going to do just one damage. Well, that worked out pretty well. Actually, they're not going to do any damage because we have our deflecting maneuver online. That gives us shield two against ranged attacks only. So that means that mitigates up to two damage. So one comes in, two is mitigated, and we take no damage from that attack. So the archers are done, which means it's now time for Deathwalker to go. Now they are going to start by activating their Shadow Beast right over here. It doesn't have to move, so it's going to do a two damage attack against its focus. And when they draw from the Deathwalker deck, they are going to do just one damage. Now that is fine, because Algox Guard number three now takes their 12th damage, which is exactly enough for them to be defeated. So we can clear this off. And in fact, that was the last Algox Guard period, so we can remove all of this from the scenario. And then we can swap the guard out for a loot token. Now, in addition to that, the Deathwalker defeated them, so a shadow token is going to come out because their call to the abyss is still active. And now Deathwalker can activate their cards. Now, they're going to start by doing the bottom part of Black Barrage, which lets them move one shadow token up to five hexes. Now, they currently have two shadow tokens on the board, and they've decided to move this one. So it will go one, two, three, and they'll just leave it right over here. And now it's time for them to activate Wave of Anguish. Now this says that for each shadow token on the map, at the start of this action, they can perform an attack three. 
Now, this is going to happen as if the Death Walker was occupying the spot with that shadow token. Now, this will be uh, lost after the activation, and it gives them one experience. So effectively, they get to do a three damage melee attack from every shadow token out here on the board. Now, unfortunately for them, this token right here is not adjacent to a valid thing to attack. They would love for this to be right over there as well, but uh, that's not the situation. So either way, they are going to do a three damage attack from this shadow, and it's going to hit the archer number three. So they can draw the top card from the modifier deck, and they got plus two. So that means they are doing five damage with this wave of anguish attack. That's awesome, because five is exactly what we needed to defeat that, so that was a pretty lucky draw right there. So we can remove that from the board and put a loot token down, and then Call to the Abyss will activate because they defeated that creature. Now at this point, their Wave of Anguish could activate on this Shadow Token, but not that one. This one appears to only be for the Shadow Tokens they have at the start of the action. Um, either way, this does not have a valid target, but as you can see, the Wave of Anguish is a great card. Uh, it lets you hit potentially lots of things, even with this one attack that allowed the Deathwalker to kill off that creature that wasn't even in line of sight for them. So they are now going to take one experience, and then the card will be lost. This means they will go up to 7 experience total. And then to finish out their turn, for some strange reason, they've decided they no longer want Call to the Abyss going. So they are going to deactivate it, which is going to cause it to be lost. Well, with the Deathwalker done, Blink Blade is the last one to activate. Now remember, they are currently immobilized, so they are not allowed to move. And they have decided they are going to activate the top of Temporal Displacement. Now, they are currently going slow this turn, so they would not be able to move anyway, and now they can do a loot one. Now, this lets them loot all of the tokens that are within range one of them. So that is going to be two of these tokens. This means they get to draw two cards from the top of the loot deck. So it looks like they have found some metal and snow thistle. So they can add these into their area. And now their other card is Drive Recharge. Now this is going to be the bottom action. It lets them heal two on themselves, and if they are slow, this is a four heal. Unfortunately for them, they are poisoned, and whenever a figure is healed that has poisoned, that will just remove the poison. So this is gone, but they don't get anything out of the plus two heal there. Uh, either way, not being poisoned is certainly a good thing. And at this point, the final activation of the round will be the city guards. There are still two of them out here. This one is going to start by moving once, and it is going to do a two damage attack towards Algox Archer number two. So let's have them draw from the Deathwalker stack, and they got a null. Well, that is unfortunate, so no damage happens there. And then City Guard number four will go one, two. And let's have them draw from the Deathwalker stack, considering there will be no null card in there. And they have drawn a plus one, so that means they are doing three damage which will bring this damage up to 10, and that is more than the 9 that we needed to kill off this archer. So it is going to be defeated. We can put a loot token over there, and I just realized that I slightly cheated. Uh, the city guards have initiative 51, and I did say that Blink Blade was going at initiative 99. So technically, they should have done this first, and then Blink Blade would have gone, but that's not going to impact any of the actions that Blink Blade took. The reason for that is because whenever we hit a victory condition for a scenario, we are still always going to play through the rest of that round. As you can see, when this Algox Archer was defeated, there are no more enemies. That was our victory condition, so we have one. Uh, at this point, Blink Blade would go, they would then loot, and then we would be at the end of the round, where we would not even need to do any end of round uh, tasks, because the scenario is over and we are victorious. This means we now have a conclusion to read, but I will read through this once we have taken our experience, our gold, and battle goals. That way, if you want to, you can skip this and not be spoiled about what happens when you are successful with this scenario. So we could start with experience, and remember, whether or not we were successful or we failed, we always get this amount of experience. So we get 4, Deathwalker gets 7, and Blink Blade gets 6. Now, since we are successful, we are going to get bonus experience equal to 4 plus 2 times the level of the scenario. Again, the scenario level is dictated by the level of monsters we fought, so this is a level 1 scenario, which means we get 1 times 2 plus 4, or 6 bonus experience. So we would log all of that down onto our individual character sheets, and then we can look to see how much gold we picked up. Now it appears we were the only ones to pick up any gold as a loot, and for a scenario level 1, every uh, gold loot will turn into 2 gold, 
So that means we could write that down onto our sheet right here. And we could also make notes about the various items we picked up. For instance, we looted one piece of wood and Blink Blade picked up metal and snow thistle. Lastly, it's time to check our battle goals to potentially take check marks. Now we can reveal Scrambler to our companions. Uh, we uh, obviously never took a long rest, so that means we would get a check mark, which again we would put right down here. And for every three of those check marks, we could check off one of these perks, which let us modify our combat decks. Remember, you also check these off every time you get to an experience threshold to level up your character. Now we can look over here, and Deathwalker's battle goal was Ravager. This says they needed to perform two actions with lost icons in the same turn. Now they thought they had this, considering they lost Wave of Anguish in that turn, and then they also lost Call to the Abyss, although at this point I now realize they did not perform the Call to the Abyss action this turn, they just lost it this turn. So I don't think that actually counts for Ravager. Uh, that's on me for not looking at the specifics of this wording very well, so that means Deathwalker would unfortunately not be able to check off one of these boxes. And finally, we can look over here to Blinkblade. Now it looks like they have Egoist, and this says they need to collect more money tokens than any other player. Well, unfortunately for them, we have one money token, and they picked up none. They were hoping with that last action that uh, both of these would be money. Remember, the vast majority of the cards in that deck are money, but unfortunately they did not grab money. Now if they wanted to make this more likely, they could have picked up some of the other loot tokens out on the board. And as you can see, there are a bunch of them that were not looted. Now, uh, perhaps they should have prioritized that because obviously getting these check marks is nice, but they were instead prioritizing killing off the enemies and uh, trying to save these city guards. So it was good for the scenario as a whole, but maybe not great for the overall campaign for the Blink Blade character. Well, with those battle goals done, we are now officially done with the end of the scenario. And at this point, if we wanted to, we could head back to the outpost of Frosthaven to do things like crafting supplies, leveling up our character if we got to enough experience, or also trying to build out the town. Now, with all of that in mind, the final thing that I want to do is read out the conclusion here for our successful completion of the A Town in Flames scenario. When an Algox falls, it does so with force. It shakes the ground like a felled tree and crushes anything beneath it. So when you drop the last fighter in this group, you do so with care. Seeing this, the remaining Algox slacken a little. They know the tide has turned. They call out for retreat, tilting their heads up and releasing a long, ragged howl. The noise carries out over the entire town, and within a few moments, they are streaming out of Frosthaven like giant white mice. You lower your weapon and breathe. They'll be back. You are certain of it. But for now, you can rest. You wipe the soot from your face and take stock. Frosthaven is almost exactly what you imagined, a knot of gray stone and timber surrounded by sharpened palisade walls, a place where mere survival is an everyday concern and where only the desperate and hard could feel at home. Thankfully, though, the townsfolk are tough. They're already on their feet, putting out the fires and picking through the rubble. In fact, one of those townspeople is marching right for you. It's a woman, short and severe, with a fighter's muscular build and closely cropped hair. Her face is solid like carved marble, but as she steps past some of the bodies laying on the ground, her face folds just a little and she mutters something to herself. But she keeps moving, and, coming into the town square, offers an outstretched hand. Oak be praised, she says, and crushes your fingers with enthusiasm. We wouldn't have held out much longer without you. You acknowledge the thanks and ask what happened. Oh, just life up north is all, she chuckles, but there is a clear pain in her voice. I'm Satha, mayor of this fort now that my predecessor and his lieutenant have fallen. As for the Algox, they've been at us all winter. Took them months to break through, but they finally did. Probably killed a dozen or so of my men, and would have done worse if you hadn't shown up. You explain who you are, that you've been sent from White Oak, and relief creeps into her face. Well then, our luck has turned, she laughs, and clasps your shoulder hard. There's not many of you, but I'll take what I can get, especially now that our garrison's been thinned. And, as it happens, I have an idea. She turns and gestures to the town's smoldering walls. We took a beating in that fight, so if we're going to survive much longer, we'll have to do more than just sit around and wait for the next attack. Her smile widens a bit, and you watch her size you up. With the state of our defenses, we need to be a bit more proactive here. I want you to follow the Algox into the southern mountains while their trail is still warm, and try to find a way to slow down these attacks. You feel her grip tighten, and watch as her smile grows wide. What say you? So that has wrapped up this successful first scenario of Frosthaven. 
Now again, I do want to emphasize that I am playing with a prototype here. So the specifics of this scenario, as well as the story, and pretty much everything else you see, could well change in the final version of the game. Well, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough, even though there were a fair number of small to significant mistakes that happened. Uh, the biggest mistakes that seemed to happen over and over again was simply having us walk through a wall. Um, there is a door to enter the second room, and we kept not using that door. And um, in a couple of instances, that had a real impact. Uh, in one instance, a city guard uh, was able to do damage when they should not have been able to reach their target. And another big moment was when we ran in as the banner spear and did an incendiary throw that if we had played correctly, would not have been in range. Now, that incendiary throw wounded two of the monsters, and the sooner you wound a monster, the more damage they will take over time, so that was significant. Um, another mistake was obviously us missing the shield on the shaman, so they uh, the shaman was removed from the board at least one round before they should have, because I thought those city guards had taken them out, but that is not the case. Now, um, if we had played that correctly, then it's uh, somewhat likely that the shaman would have done more damage to one of those two city guards, which would have made the overall situation more perilous because, of course, we would have lost this scenario if all of the city guards were killed, and two out of the four were killed. So um, things could have been a little bit more tricky if I had not made quite so many mistakes overall. Um, there was a, a big moment where the Death Walker teleported over and revealed the next area, and I think that also could have gone worse overall. Uh, I suppose we didn't know that the Algox guards were not moving in that uh, moment, so it was a little bit less risky, uh, but still. Um, um, that was a moment where a little bit more bad luck from the monster draw deck could have made things a lot uh, more worrisome because, of course, we also lose if everyone is exhausted. And if the Deathwalker had taken more damage there, then they might have exhausted earlier, which would have taken them and the Shadow Beast out of play, which meant that less damage would happen and more damage would be focused on to us and, uh, in particular, those city guards. So, um, in general, I think we had a slightly easier time of uh, being successful in this scenario because we got a little bit lucky and because I made some mistakes that seemed to, in general, help us more than hurt us overall. But I still think this was a good representation of what Frosthaven feels like to play as you are trying to uh, manage your cards, uh, discuss things with your companions, and try to overcome the obstacles that the scenario is presenting you. Uh, so once again, uh, this was a prototype version of the first uh, scenario for Frosthaven, and it's very likely that it's going to uh, change between now and the final product. Uh, maybe some small tweaks or maybe even some big ones overall. Overall, but um, either way, I think that is going to wrap up all of my thoughts on this play. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.